What's up, everybody? My name is Chris Roscoe. You probably know that by now. And I have a very special guest today named Elizabeth. Why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, I didn't even prepare for that. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Grace. I am fucking awesome. No, I'm just... <laughs> I can attest to that. That's 100% right here. Um, so I... I coach people around sexuality and intimacy. Um, I coach a lot of men, a lot of men work with me, couples, women. Um, but yeah, around, around the embodiment of, of what's true for them and living, living authentically and being fucking badass. So that's, that's my jam. That's what's up. So cause yeah. that, that's one of the main reasons I want to talk to you is because as far as I'm concerned, my, my whole thesis on life in general is to just be real about whatever it is you think, feel and want. And mm -hmm. things will more or less work out. And it sounds like when you said like, you know, cause it's my, in my experience in my opinion that pretty much all coaching leads there anywhere, whether it's weight loss or confidence or dating or sex or whatever it is, you're pretty much just helping someone become honest. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to talk to you in particular about some of the current dynamics that are happening because uh, you know, we live in different countries, but I'm sure we experience some of the same cultural stuff. Like here in America, guys don't know what the fuck to do. They like, and that's fine. It's, it's not a bad thing that they don't. It's just the rules have been changing so much that a lot of us are lost and mm -hmm. we never even had a good foundation to start with. And so now that things are changing, the reference points, we don't know what the reference points are. We don't know where we're going. We don't know anything. And there's only so much I can do. And I really like you as a person. I like your perspective. I like the way you go about doing things. I like the ethos behind your work. And so I thought that your perspective could be a really nice compliment to whatever it is that I have to say. So I really want to thank you for being here and, and talking. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> good. Good. Thank you so much. So, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the juiciest things that I wanted to talk about, which I guess we could get into it because God knows where this is going to take us. Oh, is yeah. <laughs> uh, is uh, the topics of like masculinity and dominance and act, like things that used to be considered manly that now a lot of the times are considered toxic or let's just go with toxic. So I want to know from you, like, like what's the line? Like, how, like, like what is toxic versus what makes sense? Because I don't really see a whole lot of sophistication in this conversation. It seems to be very cut and dry. And so I'd love to hear from your perspective, like what, what separates toxic from healthy? Um, I would say perception. Um, mm. Just to okay. be like a real dick about it. Um, <laughs> I have, <laughs> I've invited in the dynamic of a real dominant mas masculine man um, to enable me to play with my submissive surrender in a real empowered way. Mm -hmm. So what one would see a dynamic as being really toxic, um, for me, it was extremely useful. <laughs> um, so, so I I'm would- gonna, I'm gonna dissect that a little bit yeah. alone because that was big right there. So what to you is, what does that dynamic even look like? Like in a real day-to-day, -day, like, like what the hell is that? Like what would be required in order for you to actually surrender? Cause you said the word submissive mm -hmm. and that word, uh, like, like you might as well have said some racial slurs just now. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a very, very big deal of a word. Mm -hmm. And so what's required in order to allow you to do that? And what does that even mean to you? So, um, the term I use is empowered submissiveness. Um, so yeah, that's pretty badass. Um, and so this was, <laughs> sorry about it. Um, this was a, a situation with a lover during sex, um, where in which <laughs> in a roundabout way, he was playing out his dominant, um, mm -hmm. and I was teaching him a, a way to bring that dominance in sex in a real sacred way, you know, so that it wasn't, um, fucking just, sorry, <laughs> but not no, sorry. Um, <laughs> And um, so it wasn't mindless fucking, but that it was really conscious, really present, um, and who he was being while being that masculine, that dominant, um, was he was still connected to me. So mm -hmm. 
because I have a really strong understanding of my boundaries, what I like, what I don't like, we had, um, you know, through this uh, connection that we have outlined these boundaries and have a really clear understanding um, of what we consent to. And so within that, that enabled me to be become, you know, embody this empowered, like extremely empowered um, submissive nature where I did what I was told. And, you know, <laughs> if, you're, if you're that way inclined as far as, um, you know, submission, dominance and stuff, then you understand the dynamic of um, the submissive being in control, you know, in a, in a mm -hmm. healthy relationship. Yeah, because um, you essentially is, make all the rules. Exactly, exactly. Um, so although the dominant partner may be going to town on you, you can put up your hand or, or whatever word you have and say stop. And they're going down. To town on me here. Uh, based on parameters that you've set up before the engagement ever began. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, because I that's the role I play. Mm -hmm. So like from my from the perspective of the dominant person, you've got like, okay, like here's the here's the fuck yeses. Here's the like, mm -hmm. okay, maybes, and then here's mm -hmm. the like probably nots, and here's the definitely nots. And within that, Absolutely. you get this whole realm to play. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the same with relationships in general. Once you have those outlines of what a definite fuck yes is, what are things like, actually, I'm not happy with that, you know, but I'm happy to compromise, you know, I'm willing, it's not, it's not fucking with my core beliefs, um, you know, I'm willing to compromise on that. And then you have the ones that you're like, no, mm -hmm. you know, not going to happen. So I think um, in the realm of being a to toxic masculine, um, I think it depends on the dynamic and the perception of the people that you're relating with. Um, mm. Mm. So in, in your view then, what would you yeah. consider toxic? Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, anything that's fucking with another person. You know, like if it's societal outlines, if you're harming someone else, that's toxic. If you're harming yourself, that's toxic. Um, and I'm assuming that means like in a non-consensual way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> you to know, clarify. Because you like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. If it's, if it's not consensual and you're harming, I think those are the parameters for me. If you're causing harm to yourself or another person, um, then that's toxic. That's pretty fair. And I can completely agree with that. Because as far as... My, as far as y'all are consenting and have agreed to doing whatever you're doing, I don't really give a shit what you do. None of it's toxic as far as it's, it's agreed upon and welcome. Mm -hmm. um, and I think up until you get into sexual relationships, it's harder to negotiate what is and isn't toxic. Because once you're getting into like an actual sexual dynamic, then it's mm -hmm. like, okay, like, okay, now we know all cards are on the table, blah, 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 blah. But getting up until that point, you don't necessarily know what you're dealing with. And so the the boundaries Which are getting is a little fucked, bit. really isn't it like in general relationship and general connections with people i feel um we should be communicating those parameters you know why is it that we wait until sex and i mean uh, vanilla sex you don't usually navigate those parameters in general you know it's only in the realms of realm of bdsm that you actually learn that you can have these these kind of parameters, these outlines, these boundaries, and then you can go play and fucking fuck for all. But in general connection and general reality, I don't think that there's enough discussion around that. That's my, yeah. I mean, that's my opinion. <laughs> I'm no expert in this. Whatever I share is just my thoughts and beliefs, whatever I've kind of embodied. Um, so, hey, people that are watching, just take it or leave it. <laughs> I don't mind. Well, sh <laughs> well, sure. I actually totally agree with that. And that's been my experience, you know, until, you know, because I got introduced to all this stuff uh, from an ex-girlfriend that was really into BDSM. And so she educated, and we're still really good friends. So she educated me on all this stuff, and it totally changed the way I view all of it. And it, at, and you know, at times it can be a little cumbersome because you're like, Jesus Christ, I have this conversation, and this conversation is vulnerable and scary, and I don't know if the other person's gonna like it, and I have to tell this other person all this weird shit that I'm into, and that could be the end of this, and God damn it. But that's but, so liberating as well. <laughs> Totally. That's what I was getting to is like, once you walk through that, it's like, okay, well now y'all know what I want and it, it's, mm. we're good to go. So it's, mm -hmm. it's way more exciting than fumbling through it and then trying something and hoping that it works. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's not good. I've, I've done that and that's not enjoyable. <laughs> but 
Okay. So I feel like we've outlined, you know, what's toxic versus what's healthy and consent seems to be a huge factor in that. So I actually, this is a question I don't know that I've ever really asked too many people. So I'm really stoked to get to dissect this with you is what, so I'm going to frame this from the perspective of assuming that a lot of the people that are listening to this are going to be into semi-traditional roles. Well, there's one dynamic where there's one submissive person and one dominant person. doesn't really matter if it's the guy or the girl. I don't really give a shit. doesn't matter if it's two guys or two girls or two, whatever. I don't care. But we're going under the assumption that those are the dynamics that you're interested in uh, because those are the dynamics that I'm genuinely curious about. And so those are the ones that I'm going to ask about. So that's, I think that's, that's safe. So what is it about playing the submissive role that's even interesting for you in the first place? Oh, um, you know, what? and as far as like intimacy or in general, like what, like yeah. what about your brain when you finally do set up the dynamics and you find the right partner and you get to mm. let go, like, why is that a desirable outcome to, to even put all that work into getting there? Why, why would you put that much work to get there? So for me personally, um, I'm, I'm quite masculine in my work. Like I'm, I'm quite dominant in my work. Um, and so it's really nice to let go of that mm. and to be able to trust that the lover or partner or whatever, who I'm with, um, has the capacity to hold me, um, in, in my surrender. Um, you know, just let me go and, and they take charge. That's oh, so fucking delicious. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's my interest because I live a life in which I'm very proactive um and i make and create and i'm very assertive so it's nice to drop into a dynamic in which i don't have to take control um i've also played the other realm as well where i have um and i enjoy that as well but yeah in general it's um it's really a fucking turn on to watch a man step up and step into power and as a woman or as you know the other partner to just drop back and be like yeah you know <laughs> Um, and just and just enjoy it and to to watch them um really amplifying themselves it's like when you go and and watch a musician on stage and they're like going to town and they are amazing they're rocking out what they're doing and you're just so entranced by them mm -hmm. and that to me the dynamic of this really strong empowered masculine man is or you know whatever dynamic um when someone steps into their power it's just like holy shit you're fantastic and it's mm -hmm. super, super arousing. So um, yeah, for me, that's, that's why I enjoy playing with it. Great. That's a fantastic explanation. I, I totally get it. So what, what do you need to see? Like, like, give me an example of what this, I don't remember your exact words. So something about in, embodied healthy masculine or something like that. <laughs> what, what, what does that actually look like to you? Like, how would you know if you saw that? Hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a, we have these social patterns, you know, that we expect, um, you know, a masculine man to be this Hulk from the gym. That's, that's crazy delicious. <laughs> and we have this, um, yeah, this really interesting idea of what we think a masculine man looks like. Um, and yet there's so many different parameters as, as to how a man can step into his, his masculine empowerment. Um, you know, he could be extremely intellectual, intellectual and be a whiz kid tech wise. You know, he could be um, super social. And so he rocks out in social scenarios and just like lights up the room, like magnetic in that way. Um, you know, he could be emotionally connected, you know, or spiritually connected. So there's so many different dynamics in which a masculine man can be you know, this embodied masculine man. Um, I don't think there's a one size fits all. I think there's that when people understand what really gets them going, you know, like what they really love, enjoy, love and enjoy doing. And when they do it, that's them embodying their mm. truth, you know, embodying their version of masculinity. So I don't think there is a one size fits all. Um, 
and that's my personal op- opinion there. <laughs> no, I love that. And it's the, the complexity of it is what I like about it because mm-hmm. it's it, pretty much anybody could fit into that. You know, like, like I'm not a big guy by any means. Like I don't, I'm not this fuck, like you said, I'm not just like, I don't go to the fucking gym all the time and I'm not just like ripped ass dude but I consider myself super masculine. And so I don't compare myself to those guys. So it doesn't really bother me, but I know that there's a lot of other people that, like you said, are going to think like, okay, like if I'm going to be a masculine man and if I'm going to get like a powerful, like respectful woman to want to get into this like kind of consensual power dynamic with me, then I have to be a certain archetype. Like how do I fit into that archetype? And I, I don't, Think that's what it is and i love that you pointed to that you sound you look like you have something to say i was just gonna say um the idea of men having to be masculine mm-hmm. i mean that's another dynamic as well there is the balance of masculine feminine you know like we all have it within us i know i'm extremely masculine but i know i love being sensual and feminine and it's not you know they have very different roles but you can be an extremely strong feminine woman you know or an extremely empowered masculine man but you can also be an extremely strong feminine man, mm-hmm. you know, or an empowered masculine woman. Like there's no set way. If you are feminine by nature as a man, and that is where, you know, like within your realm, if you are just fucking fantastic on fire when you're in your feminine, be fucking in your feminine. Don't feel like you need to be a fucking masculine man. Um, oh. So yeah, I, I think that, that there's that line as well, that there's, there's these bullshit beliefs around men having to be masculine, where as if your innate kind of nature is empowered within your feminine side, fucking yeah, rock me, out. Personally, I think I need both. Cause you know, my dad died when I was a kid. And so I was raised by a single mom. And so mm-hmm. my, the feminine influence in my life is really heavily, is really heavy. I've more or less got along better with women uh, my whole life than I ever did with guys. Um, I'm better with my emotions than pretty much, you know, most guys that I know. And it took me a long time to develop my masculine side. Um, Mm -hmm. and I did it because not doing it was causing me psychological pain. And so I think there is a distinction. Like if you're more feminine by nature and you're happy being that way as a guy, then awesome. But if you're more feminine by nature as a guy and you're fucking miserable, then you might need to up your masculinity a little bit because it may not actually be your natural alignment and you may actually need to be doing some stuff. Um, Mm. But yeah, no, you can go either way. And I, it wouldn't make sense for all guys to be masculine. I don't, I don't think that would actually make sense. And because Um, you get women like me who are like super masculine. And if I wasn't inclined to drop into submission in my relationships, as a masculine woman and a masculine man in a relationship, there's sometimes a dynamic that doesn't quite work, you know, if oh. you're both butting heads on stuff. So it's nice to have feminine men, you know, yeah. it's needed. <laughs> yeah. Or at least have a little bit of give, you know, cause even if we're talking about setting up these, uh, these scenarios, like we were just talking about a second ago, if mm-hmm. either one of you is hundred percent masculine and you can't be vulnerable enough to talk about like, okay, so here's the things I don't like and why, you're never going to set up a really successful scene in the first place. So there's just in order to really step into the the masculine side of yourself, a a little bit of femininity is necessary. Otherwise you're just pathological and and reactionary and unhealthy. So I want to go into something that you said a second ago, because these are concepts that I'm actually not really all that familiar with. And I think could be really, really helpful to a lot of guys listening. Uh, I want to break down these different versions of masculinity that you mentioned because they're honestly Mm. new to me. Like intellectual Mm. masculinity is not something I've ever heard before. So I'd love to hear more about that. Oh, um, that was just me going off on a tangent, really. Um, Well, it had to come from somewhere. (laughs) Um, I was just thinking about the, the men that I've met and the men that I've worked with and what about them has um like i've worked with some pretty incredible people and i was thinking about what about them really attracted me to them um and and them to me and um these are men that are definitely not the stereotypical masculine 
Um, so the being intellectual and really owning it on that stage, um, you know, the, I've got like tech guys and creatives and inventors and shit and they own it and mm. they don't go into a situation pretending that they have to be some macho gym buff. I love that. We always drop back to that. <laughs> um, well, that's know, what we all know, you know, starter, yeah, but, but they, they rock into these rooms knowing their shit you know, if they are tech or if they are these different dynamics of, of masculine, they they learn what works for them. You know, what is their version of masculine? Um, hmm. I love that. So it sounds like it's a, it's a distinction. It's, it's like looking a little bit deeper because before, in order to identify a masculine person that may be a, a, a good match for, you know, preferences that, like yours, uh, you'd look at like, you know, like we've been fucking talking about this, like big bulky dude that may or may not have anything valuable to say, but he's fucking huge. So like, yeah, he'll do. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, that was the old way. And um, it sounds like what you're talking about is looking a little bit deeper and saying like, okay, like let's, 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 let's kind of, we can do away with the aesthetic version of it and just say like, how much is this person owning what they're doing? Whatever it is they're doing, are they 100% being themselves? Like that sounds like the bigger question. Yes. Is that yes. accurate? I was, um, yeah, absolutely. I was listening to some, um, some work from a teacher of mine just earlier today. And one of the statements that I wanted to share, I mean, she was talking in relation to sex, but in life really, um, she said, it's not what you're doing, it's who you're being. And I was just like, yes, you know, yeah. that, that's pretty cool because it doesn't matter what you do. She was talking in relation to, you know, I could teach you all these certain tricks and how to park and this, that, and the next thing, you know, so you can get what you want. Um, or you can make a girl happy or whatever. But you could do all those but not be present, you know, mm -hmm. or you could be doing all of those but not feeling empowered or embodied in yourself. So it's, yeah, the steps will work, but actually it's about who you're being at the core. 100%. So what... So what would you say to someone, to a guy who isn't necessarily sure about what his deal is? Hmm. You know, he's like hearing this and he's like, yeah, okay. Like, yeah, I, I get this. Like, I don't, I don't have to be this certain thing. All I have to do is me, but mm -hmm. what the hell am I? Like, what would you say to someone under those circumstances? Mm -mm -mm. Um... See, the thing is, for me, and the work that I've done with people, is um, who we are currently has maybe served us to a point, but isn't serving us anymore, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, in as much as I could encourage you to look at yourself and look at the things that you do and, um, you know, what you enjoy and, and how you live and who you are, um, I would encourage you to kind of identify who you want to be. Hmm. You know, the, the kind of man or woman you want to be um, and and get into why you're choosing those things, you know, and as far as uh, the it's like identity play of, of who you want to become, um, what you'll gain from becoming that um, and your drivers around that. So that's what I would encourage. Hmm. So, okay, so who are you interested in being? Mm. And then taking a look at why in the hell are you interested in being that mm -hmm. and seeing what you can extrapolate just from those questions. Cause that's, I agree. Like if you are making an honest attempt at answering those questions, you should be able to at least get a lead on mm -hmm. what interests you on, on what direction you may be able to start down and begin experimenting on. Like you should at least get a start from that. And so I, I completely agree. So <laughs> there's this other question that's been, uh, in the back of my head and seems like a good time to ask it. So how would a guy flirt with you? With me personally? With you personally. How would you, <laughs> how would you recommend somebody flirting with you? They, they see you at a, I don't know where you hang out, but they see you hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's say grocery store or whatever. They, they probably don't hit on people at the grocery store, but, um, somebody sees you out somewhere or, or a woman that they're interested in and they say to, to themselves like, wow, look at her. She's embodying this thing that I want to be close to. Uh, she's someone I'm interested in getting to know. 
what do you do? Mm, mm, mm. Um, uh, hi guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's go with your grocery store. Um, okay. I was just there earlier today, so it's kind of perfect. And eye contact. Mm. So first off, I need to know that you're looking at me. You know, if, if you're interested, um, eye contact. Make eye contact and make serious eye contact. Don't just look at me and then look away and freak what out. What is serious eye contact? What does that mean? Like holding it. Okay. You know, like a little bit longer than you probably should so that I know it's not just a glance. Mm. You know? Like intentional, and like, yes, I'm looking yeah. at you. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, and if I look back, that's me kind of consenting. You know, if, if I catch a glance and I'm not just like, oh my God, fuck. <laughs> and I look back. <laughs> Which I'm assuming would be visually like, there'd be some kind of cue that you weren't into it. I would turn away. You know, okay. I would be like, oh. and then I would turn and I would be like, yeah, oh that my God. Face. Oh, that yeah. face should yeah. be a dead giveaway every time. <laughs> yeah. If somebody makes that face, you'd abort mission. Yeah, I'm quite a yeah facial person. <laughs> um, so if, if mission has not been aborted and I've turned and be like, oh, hi. You know, like if I've, if I've looked back and I've held your glance a little bit longer than I probably should, then that's me consenting. So after that, come and talk to me. Come up and just say, hey, I saw you. Um, I know this is kind of weird. We're in a supermarket. I get that. But um, I just wanted to know your name. That's so good because it's, that's, that's kind of what I would tell somebody because <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know exactly how this happened, but guys, you know, for better, or for worse, we're still uh, operating in large part under this idea that there's a right thing to say and yeah. that you need some kind of like stunning fucking line. <laughs> opening liner, you know? And uh, do not walk up to a woman and say, "Can I have your number? I think you're hot." Like, don't even go there. <sighs> oh my, I had yeah, because like, up. no shit. That's kind of kind of assumed. But w like, without even asking me for my name, I had this guy come up to me um, last month, month before, and just walked up to me and was just like, "Can I have your number? You look really hot." And I was just like, <sighs> "Um." No, <laughs> but like if, if you had engaged me and said, you know, hey, my name is whatever. I saw you over here and I just wanted to introduce myself. Yeah, fucking sweet. Get talking, you know, tell me something about yourself. Compliment me on something that you genuinely think is interesting. Ask me about myself. Communicate this amazing thing called communication. Huh. <laughs> Who would have thought? And then, you know, if I'm smiling, if I'm engaged, if I'm not running the fuck away from you, say, hey, um, let's catch up for, you know, would you be interested in catching up for a drink, a coffee, lunch, you know? I love that because the, the foundational predicated thing is honesty. Yes. You know, like my friends will, will come to me and be like, yo, I don't know what to say to this girl. And I'm like, what do you want to say? <laughs> Like, yeah. what is it about her that attracts you to her? Like, what's the thing that had you be like, yeah, you, whatever that is, lead with that, go with that and be honest about it is what I'm always telling people. And so it's really glad to have you validate that. But there's also another thing that I think is a little bit more challenging is in order to be good at this, you have to actually be paying attention to whether or not the person wants to be talking to you. Yeah. On a, on a situational moment to moment basis, you need to be aware of whether or not the conversation is going well, and you need to be able to be honest about that. And I think that takes a level of uh, emotional capacity that I think is difficult for people in general, men and women alike, you know, to, to stay present with the continued ongoing knowledge that at any moment this could go bad and you could get rejected how but when it does as well who cares you know like i was out having a drink with a guy the other day um just old friends catching up and i just got that kind of yeah well, this is boring now and i just kind of <laughs> straight out said i didn't say it but it's just like sweet you know well it was really nice catching up with you i'm gonna head off now you know just call it call it mm -hmm. before it starts getting really awkward don't just sit there if you start feeling it 
you know, nine times out of 10, the other person's probably feeling the same way. You know, we have these amazing thing called, things called mirror neurons, which pick up on how other people are feeling. And if we are aware of ourselves, we can also be aware of the other people we're with. You know, you can pick up on social cues, body language, how they're interacting, on how the conversation's going. You usually mm-hmm. know if it's not working out. So just call it or just be like, well, this kind of got awkward, didn't it? Make a joke, make them laugh. You know? Yeah, I love that so much because just being able to call attention to an awkward moment, I think is, is really going to make things easier for everyone involved. It's going to make it easier for you. Generally, the person you're talking to is going to be like, oh, thank God he said something. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Cause I was fucking dying over here. Like <laughs> I, <laughs> that's generally my experience of saying something like that. And so And that's the interesting thing of going back to this whole idea of masculinity is a masculine guy would never say that like a, like, or like a macho, a macho guy would never say that a macho guy would never be like, Oh, that got fucking weird. A macho guy would be like, like, check out my muscles. Yeah. He'd be like, what's your problem? Are you feeling weird? I'm not feeling weird. This is, this is on you. But in order to, to let that go and let yourself be a little bit vulnerable. And, and let's, let's not be saying that all macho guys are like that. I have met some absolute delicious beefcakes that have brains. So let's not put that green generalization out there. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not talking about body type. I'm talking about uh, archetypes, mental archetypes of, of the macho guy that yeah. is just ridiculous i mean i live i live in california so there aren't really a whole ton of those here so as far as i'm concerned they're an urban myth but i know in in the rest of the world they're all over the place (laughs) okay so uh we've covered a pretty damn good job about how to flirt okay so (laughs) but but there's more there's more uh what about the fear of rejection because i think that's what's going to stop most guys from ever making the approach in the first place how what do you do about that because you know the i think the interview that you were watching when that had us meet in the first place uh the advice that was given love the guy who gave it but i couldn't believe this is what i heard he's like if you're nervous and you're not feeling 100 percent, don't even try and i was like okay no but okay so what would you say if you're afraid of rejection but you don't want that to stop you mm, okay um i'm in two minds about this one so i am of the kind of belief that no i won't say belief um i'll just say it so what have you got that they would want you know that you can offer so Mm -hmm. what is it about you that is fucking fantastic um that the other person may be of interest in so there's that there's there's feeling um feeling like you've got something worth giving mm-hmm. which can be a trigger for some people so please don't take this the wrong way um <laughs> but i for me personally i don't want to step into a relationship um if i don't have something of value to offer you know i want it to be an equal give and take kind of a situation mm-hmm. um so for guys that that want to go for it but are feeling fear, um, own it. Honestly, I'd say own that you're feeling fear. Don't don't be like, um, I'm feeling fear. I shouldn't feel this way. I would say question how you can use that fear to encourage you. What is it that you are afraid of, and how can you use that to challenge you to push your boundaries to push past fear? I fucking love that. So what, what's an example of that? How would somebody take a fear and use it uh, for their benefit? What would that look like? Mm, um, anything that you're afraid of. So if you're afraid of it, you've either got a past experience of um, the situation screwing up and you've perceived yourself to be harmed or, you know, in an unsafe situation or whatever. Um, or you're fearful because you haven't done it before. So it's stretching your, your mm-hmm. parameters around your experience. Um, so in the whole dating thing, you're at a library and you see a really hot library assistant because I don't go to bars. I go to libraries. Um, <laughs> pro tip, fellas. Pro tip. <laughs> Pick out the go to the library. 
Um, so yeah. <laughs> you're scared of walking up and and chatting to this chick, whatever. Um, ask yourself why you're scared. What is it about the situation that you're scared of? And is it a space where you can grow and push yourself? And even if you did get rejected, at least you pushed yourself. And then mm. you can, you know, can try again. I mean, fuck, it's a numbers game, really, isn't it? Um, no, I'm not going to say <laughs> I've never heard a woman say that before. <laughs> oh, but my no, God. I, like, if, if you're scared of something, if you do it often enough, you'll stop being scared of it. Oh, that's you fucking know, good. If, if you... <laughs> I remember going on a roller coaster when I was like, 13, 14, and I like afraid of heights. I'd never been on a roller coaster before, and I was fucking freaking out. My life wasn't at risk, you know, like that's the thing. My life was not at risk. It was just a psychological um, fear because I hadn't done it before. Sure. My girlfriend made me get on that roller coaster. The first time around, I sat with like my head between my knees, holding on, closed eyes, and I did not move. I was so fucking frightened. By the 44th time around the roller coaster, it was a quiet day at the theme park. I was like, yeah, you know, I ruled that shit and it wasn't a problem, you know? So by doing these things in which I faced my fears because I was fucking scared, but I did it. I did it anyway. So I would say, check in with yourself. Are you going to die? Are you, you know, in a situation? <laughs> Are you in physical danger? <laughs> Are you in physical danger? Um, are you going to get stabbed? Um, or is it just your ego is going to get hurt? And if your ego gets hurt, is it a bad thing? You know, like how, how much of a bad thing is that going to be for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, my whole thing. As far as I'm concerned, uh, rejection is, is the, it's, it's the cost of a good life. Like if you want to have a good life where you're having good sex and you're going after your dreams and you're putting yourself out there and you're living life to the fullest, rejection comes with it. Mm. I mean, I've been rejected so many times, but I don't care. Yeah. You what, know, are you, what are you going to do? So what? It's not, it's not me. It's just, it wasn't right for the situation. Mm -hmm. And I think the moment you can separate the two between, cause like I, I mean, for me personally, I think getting rejected on the basis of who I really am actually feels good. If someone genuinely understands who I am and what I'm all about, and they decide that that's not right for them, then that actually feels good to me. Then it's like, okay, cool. Then great. Whatever. It's a, a lot of time. The only time rejection really hurts me is when I feel misunderstood is when I feel like that, like I got rejected for something that the other person didn't get about me. Uh, or I misrepresented myself or something like that. That's when rejection bothers me. But when you're a hundred percent or when I'm a hundred percent myself and I get rejected, it doesn't bother me at all. And so I think a lot of the advice that I would personally give is how can you learn how to represent yourself really well? And so that even if you do get rejected, then it's like, okay, that just, like you said, that just didn't fit and that's okay. And and I think that's see, a like, so thing. My, my experience, um, I spent a lot of my life pretending not to be me. So mm -hmm. I had, you know, fear going on, um, bullshit going on around. Um, I was bullied quite a bit when I was younger. I got picked on. And so it was easier for me to pretend to be someone else. And yet the idea of being rejected while I was being someone else, as much as I, you know, could pretend it wasn't me being rejected, um, that hurt so much more than me mm. now that I embody my truth and I, I think own it's like shit. the opposite. Yeah, yeah, it's it's quite it's it's really fucking cool actually. And so now I feel so empowered in myself because I present myself exactly as I am. I'm not pretending to be a certain person when I interact with people. So when I get rejected, I'm just like, oh sweet, you know, they didn't like me. It's not mm -hmm. me. I'm fucking rad. But, <laughs> but there's that that comfort of ourselves. So I think. Um, you know, for people who are watching, get comfortable with who you are. I think that's a really big thing. Um, and, and owning yourself and the things that you're good at and, and not pretending to be what society thinks you should be. It's really, really important. And I think that's also something else is because in order to really fear rejection, you're essentially saying that the other person's opinion is more important than yours. Mm -hmm. 
But when you prioritize authenticity and represent yourself well and tell the truth, then that sends a really clear message that, that your opinion is more important than the other person's opinion. And so when you do get rejected, it's like, okay, well, I've already kind of prioritized that. So what's it going to do? Kill me? Probably not. So uh, let's see. We got about 20 minutes left. I'm going to do some clicking because I asked the internet <laughs> what I should ask you while I have you. And I got a couple, I actually got a couple of questions that I thought were super cool. Okay. This is, this is a great one. How does masculine energy influence a sexual turn on? Ooh. Yeah, that was from from my buddy Jeff. Quality quality dude. Wow. How what was the question, sorry? Uh how does let me get back to it. I want to make sure I get the mm. the details right. Cuz it was pretty well worded. Um how does masculine energy influence sexual turn on? For a woman or for you? For me. Because we're, we're using you as more or less an avatar of women who think the way you do. Not all women, because that's ridiculous, but women... I was going to say you're fucked. <laughs> well, yeah, no. yeah not, not of all women. That's, I'm, I'm not foolish enough to go down that path. But of women who think like you, because I think most people that listen to me and what I have to say, the, the intent of, of this is to help people who are like me, because that's all I can really do. If I'm being honest, I'm just going to be me. And mm -hmm. if I'm being honest, I'm going to be asking questions that pertain to my interests. And I'm a masculine, dominant, straight guy. So, mm -hmm. you know, like, seems to, seems to make sense to answer questions from that perspective. And so you can, you can be the mirror avatar of the strong, uh, submissive woman. So what would be... How about we just say strong, feminine? We don't have to go submissive because okay. we're not talking about... Okay. There. And you can define your own terms. I'm 100% fine with that. <laughs> How does masculine energy influence sexual turn on? Mm. So for me, masculine energy um, is it's the person's ability to um, create safety. I think that comes down, like, the, what it boils down to is um, with masculine men, do I feel they can protect me and keep me safe? Does that mean do physically? I, yeah, absolutely. You okay. know, like, I... In a so there is an age, element of, like, brute strength to it. Are there, yeah. I think, I think at the core, um, you know, like, on a primal level, if I was out in the bush... And, but then again, you know, like an intellectual masculine would be able to protect me in other ways, you know, so it may not be brute force, but they could create something, you know, there is that dynamic there as well. Okay. Um, so for me, safety, feeling protected, that, um, that the man can, can create that for me. Um, and as as far as arousal, mm -hmm. like how does that yeah. translate? Mm. Um, At what point does feeling safe and you know having the the potential of, of everything? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the, 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 everything that goes into that. At what point does that become a turn on? Knowing that I can get wild and that they can handle it. Mm. So they can handle life on its own terms, even if bad shit happens. Mm -hmm. That equates to, wow, this person can handle me regardless mm -hmm. of what happens, even if bad shit happens. Mm -hmm. Is that? And, and around um, not feeling like I need to provide for them. You know, like, and as far as they have their own life mm -hmm. and I have my own life. And we live our lives together, you know, if, if we're talking about relating and, and all So that. how does that turn into a turn on? Because I get that. Is that arousing? Like, what about I, it though? Because I get that on an emotional <laughs> level because I'm a guy where it's like, to me that, I, I know I do, I, I get it from my perspective, but I don't, I don't understand it from your, I've never heard that before. I, how, how does that make sense from your perspective? What about that is a turn on? Mm. For me personally, I like to know that men have lives. And that I'm not the center of their fucking universe. 
Um, I don't want a guy that will do everything that I say to make me happy. I want a guy that challenges me. Um, please go the fuck into that. I don't think enough people know that. <laughs> what does that mean? Like, please make this as black and white as you can. Um, <laughs> I don't want a bitch. Like, it's, it's no I bitch. Know we, we've, <laughs> we've spoken about before um, men feeling like they need to do whatever their partners say to keep mm-hmm. them happy. Um, and sometimes at a detriment to what they want, mm-hmm. you know, what they're, what they're desiring from their life. So for me, having a strong masculine man, he would also say, actually, that doesn't suit me. You know, I have these plans or I have this going on, or I'd really love to do this with you, but I'd like to do it on a different day because I have this going on in my life right now. Um, so I'm going to stop you right there because mm-hmm. the dichotomy, you know, cause I've, I've been a nice guy for God knows how long. Uh, the, the dichotomy in the thinking there is like, okay, if I don't give her what she wants, then God knows what's going to happen. And she's going to hold out on sex. (laughs) (laughs) You know, maybe that is actually the fear underneath. I've never come to that conclusion, but that may actually be the fear now that I think about it. But either way, or she'll reject me and I'll be alone or whatever it is. Maybe there's this, um, bizarre, seeming like a need to to give the woman whatever it is she wants why in as plain a terms as you can possibly give me why is that not a good idea to not give a woman what she wants well not everything like within reason you know to not because like you said it's like if you'd actually rather do something a different day why why is it better to do it on the day you want to do it rather than just bend over and be like okay yeah we'll do it this day there's a really cool um thing that I learned, so I, a personal story now, um, <laughs> own your no so that you can own your yes. Totally. So that when you say yes, you actually fucking mean it. You know, I would rather be going out with a, with a guy, going somewhere because he wants to, you know, or he mm. wants to because he wants me to be happy. And it still suits him, you know, but I don't want him coming along to every single event I have coming along to every occasion that I want to go to just because he's making me happy. Whereas on the inside, he's like, God, I wish I was watching rugby right now. You know, you know, yeah, and then he starts the resenting you and then y'all start fighting about bullshit and yes. the guy could have just done what he wanted to do in the first place anyway. Yeah. And if you can communicate that in a, you know, in a lovely compassionate way and say, you know, as I said, you know, I'd love to do this with you, but on a different day because I have this going on. If you're really clear about what your needs and your desires and your wants are within your relationship dynamic, um, then when you have those yeses, you know, you can enjoy the experience together. And when you have your no's, they're on it. And so you this know? is... And you have that understanding now. I love this because this is very distinct from another myth um, that, you know, I grew up in California. It's, it's, it's at least a myth that I grew up in. I know it's very popular in America. Um, I don't, I'm sure... It has to be, you're in New Zealand, right? Yes. Yeah, it has to be a thing in New Zealand too. I, I imagine it's a Western thing. But this idea that uh, women want to be treated like shit. And <laughs> <laughs> it's, and I, because there's something in what you're saying that leads guys down that path. they like, oh my God, if you give them everything you want, then they cheat on you and walk all over you and leave. But if you like are a dick every now and then, you know, then... They'll eating. They'll be eating out the palm of your hand. And I know that I like a challenge. Straight up, you know? and so I appreciate a guy that will stand up and be like, Meh, "Maybe not." You know, not yeah. all the time. Don't be a dick. But. Yeah, totally. But the distinction is, it's it's not that from what you're saying, it's not that women respond well to guys being dicks. It's mm-hmm. the it's it's about having an actual person. And so the real key is authenticity. It's not just every once in a while saying no just for the sake of saying no. Mm-hmm. It, like if you really want to hang out all the time then sure maybe hang out all the time if that's genuine but it sounds like the the thing isn't to like it, it's not to gauge how much you're giving versus how much you're not and be like oh am i giving too much or sh- should i hold back a little bit it's like am i being honest yeah do what's authentically right for you and there's a um a dynamic i can't remember it straight off um but s proud talks about the um desire and attraction and arousal and there has to be a little bit of fluctuation there as the yeses and the noes. And mm-hmm. um, to be 
erotically aroused by someone, there needs to be a little bit of tension. So if you're going to yeah. press your foot and say yes all the time, well then it's going to get a little bit boring. I was actually reading about this the other day. I'm going to look up the definition while I, while I have you here. Um, mm -hmm. Because the word libido, it, it means sexual desire and all that. Um, ah, but fuck, I, I'd have to do more research to get to it. But libido specifically points to conflict. Like it, with, without conflict, the, the libido doesn't exist. And there's this, like, do you know the writer David Data? You ever heard of him? Yeah, yeah, of course. So there's, there's a lot you can take from what he, there's a lot you can leave from what he says, but there are some things that I do really like. And mm -hmm. one of the things that he says is sexual uh, passion and attraction is predicated on some level on tension. Mm -hmm. uh, like you just said, of like somebody inhabiting the polar, the, the masculine pole and the feminine pole. And there's, there's give, you can switch back and forth whenever you want. But as long as those poles are being, uh, inhabited, there's going to be certain conflicts and those conflicts are actually healthy and they lead to and create sexual tension. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the biggest flaws in the whole nice guy mentality is you're not creating that tension that would lead to sexuality. And then you can have a best friend if you want, but if you want, you know, a best friend that you can fuck really well, then you're gonna have, there's gonna have to be some tension and that tension should be authentic based on what you really think. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you agree with that summarization? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, fuck yeah. So I'm curious, we're got 10 minutes left. Is there anything you wanted to cover? Oh. Because these have um, all been my ideas. So I wanna know if yeah. there's something you wanna talk about. <laughs> no, no, there's nothing specifically from me. I've, um, I've enjoyed this conversation. We've covered quite a bit. Hmm. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, this is a conversation I was really looking forward to. I, I just adore you. I think you're the best. And, you know, because I've known, you know, I lived in San Francisco for eight years. I've known a fair decent amount of sexual educators and a lot of them just bore the shit out of me. Like, I like you and I like Philippe. That's pretty much it. And, <laughs> and so, because uh, hanging out with you is like hanging out with any of my other friends. Except... Cause, cause you get the humor and you get the vulgarity and, and you don't take it too seriously. But at the same time, like there's real depth behind what you're saying and you can give a really valid and valuable insight um, that I know the people that listen to me, because if you listen to me, you're not here for the hippy dippy shit. So in, <laughs> in order to be able to get both, I think is tremendously valuable. And I just want to thank you so much for your time and your insight and, and just bring in all that you are to this conversation. Cause I absolutely loved it. Thank you, Chris. It's been it's been a pleasure. It's been really enjoyable. And I hope I hope your tribe of listeners enjoy what we have to say. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be taking feedback from this. I'm going to see if there's any questions that people have that I left out. Because, um, you know, you're like I said, you're as far as female sexual educators go, you're like top of my list of people that I would like <laughs> to talk to. If, if there's an extra issue that I didn't cover, I would hit you up first ahead of everyone else. So we may have to do this again and follow up on some questions that I didn't think of. Um, but either way, again, I thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thank you. Cool. Awesome. And I would, I'd love to do it again. It's been a good. All right. I'm going to click this little button and uh, I think I'll talk to you later.